Okay, in this video I'm going to talk about uh, Aristotle's uh, criticism of Plato's uh, forms. As I mentioned before, Plato rejected the Platonic forms. I mean, basically he thought he just wiped them out. He thought that the form was inherent in, in, in the objects that we actually see in the world. So if you see a horse, the form of the horse, the form of the horse is right in the horse. If you have, there's two horses. Let's say I say A, let's say you've got two things, call them A and B. A and B stand for names. And we'll say A is a horse, is a horse, and B is a horse. When two things are the same, or you, when you can predicate horse of two things, A and B, Aristotle would say, Plato would say that you can do that because they participate in the form, the form of the horse. The same thing, for example, if you said A is a cat and B is a cat, the reason A and B are a cat is because they participate in the form of the cat. And you could say the same thing for a table. A is a table, B is a table. The reason is, is that they participate in the form of the table. That means there is some table that you cannot actually see. It's a mental, it's an abstract idea. But it's more real than this. The form for Plato is more real than particulars. So instead of, I'll generalize now, instead of just writing, you know, table, horse, cat, dog, I'll just say if A is, if A is, is F and B is F, then they participate in the form of F. And F obviously I'm using because for form. So if A is F and B is F, they participate in the form of F. Is if A is a table and B is a table, they participate in the form of the table. That's called the one over many argument. The one is the form and it makes sense of the many. It makes sense of what we mean when we say A is a table and B is a table. What are we talking about? Well, because they participate in the form of the table. They participate and you can also always put like, you can refer to it as tableness. They participate in the form of the horse. They participate in horseness. They participate in the form of the cat. They participate in catness or cattiness. Two things participate. If two things are beautiful, if A is beautiful and B is beautiful, if A is F and B is F, and in this case I mean beautiful, then they participate in the form of beauty, which is also for Plato when when Plato. A is, if A is beautiful and B is beautiful, it's because they participate in the form of beauty, which for Plato is perfectly beautiful. If two things participate in the form of the horse, the horse is a perfect horse. So the form is perfect. If A is a table and B is a table, they are tables because they participate in the form of the table, which is a perfect table. Okay, that's how Plato looks at it. If A is just and B is just, they participate in justness, which is perfect, perfect justice. If A is good and B is good, in this case, F is good. If A is good and B is good, they participate in the form of the good, which for Plato is perfect goodness. And for Plato, I should mention, uh, the, the form of the good is the highest of all the forms. It's the greatest, it's the most perfect of all the forms. Because all the forms are good, and because they're all good, they participate in the form of the good. This is called the one over many argument. The one over many argument. And it's one way of making sense of what we mean by universal terms. In the Middle Ages, from like around 1000 to 13 or 1400, Philosophers debated well, the, the problem of universals and, and whether they're real or not. Universal terms are terms that can be applied to more than one thing. Names are not universal. Name, names are particular. Names like names just pick out one thing. Socrates, Plato, you know, California, New York, they pick out one thing. Universal terms can be applied to many things. Colors, for example, this is red, that's red, that's red, that's red. What do we mean by red? That's a universal term. So in the Middle Ages, the people who, philosophers who believed that redness actually existed, 
independently of particular red things, were called realists because they believed that the idea was real. It was ontologically real. The people who thought, you know, many people, I think nowadays most people are what are called nominalists. Most people don't believe that when I say this is a table and that's a table and that's a table, I don't, most people I don't think nowadays believe there really is some table independent of particular tables. They believe, you know, a table and horse and cat, these are just ideas in our mind, they're ways of organizing, classifying things. Uh, this is beautiful, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. I, most people I don't think, think there really is some perfect beauty that they participate in. Arist uh, Plato did. Uh, in the Middle Ages, he would have been called a realist. If you just believe that these are ideas in our mind, that they really don't exist, you know, separate, ontologically, they're not ontologically real, uh, then you would be a nominalist. Okay, anyway, this is the one over many argument. Uh, and this is uh, Plato's, how Plato looked at it. If A is F and B is F, they are F because they participate in the form of F. And the form of F is, per, is, is F. The form of F is itself F. That's the key idea. The form of beauty is beautiful. And that's going to be raised big problems. If Socrates is a man and Plato's a man, it's because they, part or human, if you want to say, if Socrates is human and Plato is human, they participate in the form of the human. They participate in the form of man. But then the form of man is itself perfectly human or perfectly man. So if Socrates is, a, is human and Plato is human, they participate in the form of the human, which is itself human, perfectly human. If A is beautiful and B is beautiful, they participate in the form of beauty, which is beautiful. Okay, that's the one over many argument. And it's going to lead to big problems. Plato recognized some of these problems in his dialogue, the Parmenides. So these are not completely new. I mean, and, but Aristotle brought them up too. And it's called the third man argument. So I'm going to talk about the third man argument. This is Aristotle's criticism. The reason he rejected, well, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons he rejected Plato's forms. It's called the third man, the third man argument. So make, I want to go over this very clearly. What is the third man argument? We, I just went over the one over many argument. The one over many argument is an argument to show that these uh, perfect, abstract, timeless forms exist. The third man argument is going to show that th if you believe in these forms, it's going to lead to big, big problems. Basically, it's a reductio, it's an infinite regress. Or is this going to be a, basically, it's going to say that you're going to be involved in an infinite regress. That means, and what you'll see what I mean in a second. And you definitely do not want to get involved in infinite regresses because they lead to they lead to nonsense. And you and if you get in, involved in an infinite regress, basically you, something went wrong in your argument. So the third man argument is this: it's it says it it takes it it says okay, let's see what happens if the if the one over many argument is true. Let's just see the implications. If A is human and B is human, if A Socrates is human and, and Plato is, is human. So let's say I'll say F is, is human. That means they participate in the perfect human. But the perfect human is itself human. And that doesn't make sense. Socrates can be human. Plato can be human. I can be human. You can be human. But human is not human. Right? I mean, human is not human. People, individual people are human. I'll give you another example. I could be tall, you could be tall, someone else could be tall. A is tall, B is tall, C is tall, but is tall tall? No, tall is not tall. People are tall. Some, A can be beautiful, B can be beautiful, but is beautiful beautiful? No, beautiful is not beautiful. Individual things are beautiful. This is the third man argument. It goes, and it, uh, now I'll make it more general. So if A is if A is, is F and B is F, whatever F is, I'll say I'll say human. I'll use that as your example. If A is 
F, if A is human and B is human, the one third one over many argument uh, one over many argument says A is F and B is F because they participate in the form of F. But for Plato, the form of F is itself F. The form of beauty is itself beautiful. The form of tall is itself tall. The form of human is itself human. Plato is human. Socrates is human because they participate in the form of human. But for Plato, the form of human is, the form of F is F. Is human. That doesn't make sense. The form of F Human cannot be human, but now let's let's just well let's say let's just grant it, okay? Let's say okay, we'll we'll overlook that for a second. Already there's a big problem there, but let's let's just see what happens. Okay, if the form of f is itself f, now we've got a is f, b is f, and the form itself is f. Well, the one over many argument says if a is if two things are f, it's because they participate in the form of f. Okay, now, we, I'll t here's two things. B is F, and the form of F is F. So this is F, and this is F. Now, they could only be F because they participate in the form of F. That's what the one over many argument says. So we already had one form here. Now we've got to have another form of F. So if we have one form, we're going to have two forms. We'll call it form two. But the form itself, the form of F is itself F. So the form two of f is itself f is f okay now we've got this is f and this is f well they can only be f because they participate in the form of f so now we have f form three and form three is itself f so now we're going to have to have form four we're going to have to have form five that's an infinite regress. So what has happened is, so what I went over today, basically I, I explained today, I mean, this is very important. So make sure you, you know, go over it so you really understand it. The argument for the forms is the one over many argument. That's our, Plato's argument. The one over many argument, one over many argument is the argument for the forms. And it's, it goes like this. If A, these are A and B are names. They pick up particular things. A is F and B is F. Say is beautiful, is a human, is a cat, whatever. Because if A is if A is F and B is F, they participate in the form of F. But the form of F for Plato is itself. If A is F and B is F, they participate in the form of F. Well, the form of F is itself F. So now we have, I could, oh, we have, I'll just take these two. Take B is F, the form of self is F. Going back to the one over many argument, if this is F and this is F, they participate in the form of F. Well, this is the form of F here, so we'll call this, we'll call this form two. Form two of F. And which is a self f. That's going to lead to a form three, which is a self f is going to lead to form four. That's an infinite regress argument. So what Plato has done, this is called he's he's sh he has shown that the one over many argument, which attempted to show that the each if a is f and b is f, they participate in the form of f. What that's going to lead to is an infinite regress, which is absurd. And that, so this is an example of a reductio ad absurdum argument. Basically what he's doing is he's reducing the theory of forms to absurdity. Okay, and, and uh, so that's Aristotle's critique of Plato. But Plato, as I said, had already brought up this criticism in the Parmenides. So Plato himself, you know, was very critical of his own ideas too. Okay, so that's, that's all for today.